Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Professor Mario Gooden. Uh, I teach here in the school uh, in the Advanced Studios. And on behalf of Dean Mark Wigley, uh, who cannot be here tonight, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture. Um, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer, uh, Bernard Khoury. Uh, I've long admired his work uh, going back to the uh, B018 project of 1998, and it's really great to have him here tonight um, as there, we have a number of studios working in the region and to uh, get his take on what is the present in the Middle East. Uh, Bernard is uh, based in Beirut, and over the past 15 years, his office has developed an international reputation with a wide range of projects, both locally and abroad. Um, he is perhaps the only architect anywhere in the world, at least that I can think of, to address the issues of war and conflict through architecture in a manner that translates the contradictions of this context in such a brilliant uh, and often subversive manner as you'll see uh, tonight. And while in general the work is a reaction to the difficult, tough, and even sometimes macabre uh, conditions of their cultural and political context, the work does not bear the pall of pathos, but rather can be somewhat irreverent in a certain sense. And it's that uh, irreverence condition of turning the spectacle of context into the program on its head um, that is also quite, uh, quite fascinating. Additionally, what's admirable about the work uh, is the craft of which each project's intellectual rigor and criticality. However, um, it's the irreverent and subversive qualities of the work that, is also, that also allows its craft, each project's craft, in terms of its detail, construction, and fabrication to stand on its own. Um, so just a couple of official things from, from the CV. Uh, Bernard received uh, a BFA and also a BARC from, from RISD in 1990 and 1991, respectively. Um, he then uh, had a Master's of Architecture uh, degree from uh, the GSD in 1993. Um, he's been the recipient of numerous uh, architectural prizes, uh, including one of the most prestigious prizes for uh, architects under the age of 40, which is the Bor Boromini Prize that he received in 2001. And most recently, uh, he was one of the architects who had an uh, inaugural installation for the opening of the uh, Maxim Museum in Rome. So I could go on and on about uh, other uh, awards and other places in which he's lectured and taught, uh, but uh, without further ado, I present to you uh, Bernard Khoury. So, I am uh, Bernard Khoury, and I, um, and I come from Beirut. This is a very American thing to say, I come from Beirut. I've spent some time in the U.S., a few years back when I was uh, young, when I was, a, when I was a, a student in college, and when I had just arrived, I was very surprised because every time I met somebody, it was, uh, hi, I'm John, I'm from Massachusetts, or hi, I'm Bill, I'm from Nebraska, but my mother is Irish or um, that kind of thing. So it's not very European to say, I am from, um, you wouldn't see an Italian saying, I am uh, Andrea, I'm from Milano, or, or French telling you, <coughs> uh, my name is Jean-Luc, I'm from Sarcelles. But I am, I am Bernard and I'm from Beirut. And uh, the title of this lecture was supposed to be, uh, Where the Hell Are the Arabs? Where the hell are the Arabs? But but the the the, the university uh, censored my my title because it's not a very kind thing to say. Where the hell are the Arabs? So instead, the title of the lecture tonight is "Where are the Arabs in the present?" Or what is it? Whatever. But where the hell are the Arabs is, I think, a, a very legitimate question to ask. If you are an Arab. And what is it to be an Arab? I don't know. Uh, am I an Arab? That's, a, that's another very difficult question to, uh, to answer. 
Um, I will not uh, be answering any questions. Uh, the, I know the titles of these of these lectures are always interrogations, and I, I, I don't think I will be answering this question, where the hell are the Arabs, or, or, or what is the present in the Middle East. But, uh, but I will take you through a few anecdotes or a few episodes of my, of my professional career that has started about 15 years ago or a bit more. Um, that was in the early 90s. So I left the US in 1993, uh, back to Beirut, and at the time, Beirut looked like this, at least, at least in the pictures. So these are very, very nice photos, unfortunately low res, because I couldn't get the originals, taken by a colleague of mine, Fouad Al-Khouri, a very, very uh, talented photographer, who, uh, who was one of the first pho photographers to, um, to go uh, and, and, and shoot downtown Beirut, uh, or the former historical center of the city uh, that was a no man's land for 15 years after the battles. And he took uh, incredibly, incredibly beautiful pictures, uh, lots of them, uh, and this was, uh, and th they were exhibited uh, everywhere. Um, and after a while, I became very attached to these pictures and I realized how beautiful they were, how dangerously beautiful they were. There's something incredibly powerful about images of war and destroyed cities. Um, I incredibly sexy, if anything, so <coughs> this, is, this is how Beirut circulated in the early 90s, and it still does circulate. Uh, this, is, this is how Beirut is portrayed. Uh, war is very much part of the way uh, we, we, we describe our city or the way the images of our city circulate. Uh, and, and they are incredibly beautiful, dangerously beautiful. So I realized after a while that there was a danger to that, the aesthetization of war. So I moved on to something else, another, another kind of beauty. This is La Plage, oh, and th this is this is another kind of picture. Other kinds of pictures you will see about Beirut, uh, the Farniente Beirut, the voluptuous woman with uh, big boobs and um, silicone uh, lips, uh, and the nightlife, of course. Check it out: uh, www.beirutnightlife.com. Incredibly interesting. Yeah, but but uh, so this is this is what Be this is how Beirut is portrayed. And then there's another sto a lot of stories about Beirut. Uh, Beirut is also uh, is also downtown Beirut. This great reconstruction project that was that was performed by a private company called Solidaire, who were in charge of rebuilding the city center. That's a very very complicated and very interesting story. We're not going to get into that. But this is the archaeological digs, six layers of archaeology under the city of Beirut. Um, I was recently invited to, uh, to prepare to do a piece for the Maxi Museum for the opening of the, of the, of the museum last summer or the summer before. And uh, my project started with mapping points in the city uh, that had been um, exoticized. Is that the right word? No? Exoticized, extremely uh, highly charged in... Uh, in um, uh, in exoticism. Beirut is, is, has, is a city that has a lot of aura. So you have the images of war, you have the images of the beautiful woman and the dangerous man, uh, you have all these uh, very, very great, interesting stories. And this is how Beirut is consumed. Uh, it's become a touristic destination. War tourism um, and, and all sorts of other uh, curiosities. So we map these points across the city and then we try to connect them uh, in interesting ways to create um, uh, a map for the tourist so that the tourist can consume the city very, very fast through these images that, uh, that, are, that, are, uh, that market the city. And then we try to materialize this circuit by a roller coaster ride. So you can go through the ruin of the Holiday Inn, uh, literally in three seconds in and out, <laughs> very, very fast, in a very lethargic uh, position. Uh, and then we and then we we try to mount uh, these these rails across the city, and the city is consumed by this uh, by this circuit. Uh, and we found some beauty in it, some sc some scary beauty, very scary beauty in that. And in order to take that ride, obviously you have to you have to be in a capsule. Uh, you're lying down like this. Your head is where the den is in the detonator, and you're just <laughs> rolling across the city. 
uh, and then when, when you're done, uh, the porter will recuperate the, the, the capsule and will just roll it, uh, waiting for the next tourist to come. The guy lives off, um, lives off uh, tips, but the tourists never come, and he keeps rolling and rolling and rolling, and waiting for the next tourist. Uh, we, we do not only buildings, so sometimes I am commissioned pieces that are, that, uh, that are a bit outside uh, my, uh, my, my, my regular daily practice. <coughs> this is another piece we've worked on. Uh, it's called Prisoner of War, POW. POW, in fact, is, a, is an eight minutes film, a very disturbing film, disturbing film so I will, not, I will not show it to you, but I will show you the piece that featured in the film. And the piece and the whole film was built around uh, military terms, a lexicon that we got out of the military dictionary, uh, American military lexic of words. And the logic of this, of this piece is, is built on these terms and on these words. So it's a military device. And the purpose of this thing, this carcass, is uh, to, um, to exchange prisoners of war. So the guy you see in there, ramping, uh, rampant, is... Um, is a prisoner of war, he's being released, and he's crossing the enemy lines. Uh, these are not his eyes, they're the eyes of the enemies who just released him. So what he's doing is that he's scanning the, the demarcation line, and uh, he's following the orders, because if he doesn't listen to the orders, he's never, he'll never make it home. So he, he's a drone, and he's, the price of his freedom is treacher, la traîtrise, treacher, right? Uh, and, and, and POW, this piece, strangely, uh, resembles the F-117 bomber, which is an extremely fast, amazing piece of technology. But strangely here, uh, it's an extremely slow uh, animal where the man is not even a biped, but he's, he's a rampant. So with these stories, I'm invited all over the place to give, uh, you know, give my number. Uh, so I've, I've lectured in all sorts of weird areas around the world, here in Michigan. And sometimes I, I take part in talks with intelligent people, and I get extremely bored. Who the hell is Anna Miljaki? But my biggest reward uh, is not the Borromini Prize or, or the Architectural Prizes. <coughs> Where I come from, this is absolutely irrelevant. Last year, I was nominated as a giant by Johnny Walker, the whiskey. <coughs> and. Um, so for six months, at the 8 o'clock news, I had my 30 seconds clip. So now when I'm in Beirut, I'm a big celebrity, more than Renzo Piano or Jean Nouvel or anybody else. Why? Because of Johnny Walker, not the Prisker that I'll never get. So Johnny Walker was a big achievement for me. See, I'm very, very big. I'm standing tall, four stories high and more. The man who builds his dreams, johnnywalker.com. Keepwalking.com. Anyway, bigger than Paris Hilton and above Paris Hilton, see? An achievement. Have you ever seen an architect bigger than Paris Hilton? So I've, I've worked in all, in, all, in all sorts of weird areas across the planet with, with, very, um, with a very wide range of different people, like this man. You might have seen him on TV. This is Saif al-Islam al-Qazafi, the son of Muammar al-Qazafi. Uh, Muammar al-Qazafi, who had his... Uh, who had who knew a lot of powerful people at some point in time. See, he's with Sarkozy, Berlusconi, Putin, uh, even with very nice people at the UN, and even with Obama. Hmm? Can you believe it? So this was the time I was, I was involved with the SEBA hub, a project for Libya. Uh, SEBA is, uh, is, uh, is a small town, 120 people, 20,000 people. Uh, in the southern deserts of Libya, which mainly uh, lives off uh, ma the maintenance of oil rigs. This was a very short commission that was given to me, obviously, before uh, the Arab Spring. And um, we had a very little time to, uh, to comply with a program, which was two A4 sheets. The Seba hub was supposed to be uh, one of the projects that Qazafi was, was supposed to offer to his people, but we didn't have the chance to do it. Um, and the point was that uh, we, we, the, we, the program was uh, conference halls, uh, exhibition spaces, uh, you know, a hub for trading uh, so that Europeans can access uh, uh, Africa and Africans can access Europe in terms of trade 
through the Sabaha. Sabaha was the first tribe that was uh, that supported the king of the kings uh, in his revolution over 40 years ago. And, uh, and it was one of the last towns to fall, I think the third last or the fourth last town to fall uh, in the Arab Spring. So when they gave me the project, two A4 sheets, a program that was very, very abstract, three weeks to put together a concept that was to be submitted to uh, Qazafi's son. And the consultant in charge told me, your site is right around here. So you can imagine as an architect who usually works on small sites with lots of difficult regulations, it was very difficult to understand that the site was somewhere around here. So I kept on asking for a topography plan. They kept on telling me it's flat, don't worry. Uh, site limits, it's right around here. All they gave me was a Google image, which is this one, and uh, my site was right around here. There's an airport here, the town is here, and I was supposed to intervene, uh, intervene somewhere here. So what do you do in, in two, three weeks with, with a very abstract program? Something that is too small to be a city and too big to be a building, 750,000 square meters of space, roughly. Uh, I decided to do uh, the biggest, tallest, uh, no, the longest one-story intervention in the world. And I, and I thought they would love that. 750,000 square meters is pretty much seven and a half kilometers by 100 meters wide. This is my intervention. And it's pointing north towards Europe, south towards, um, towards Africa. But besides the, the very sexy marketing image that, you know, that you, we were going to sell to Gazafi, that he could see his project from any satellite image, that would, would make Dubai look stupid because seven and a half kilometers is as almost as visible as the Great Wall of China. Uh, uh, and that, that would sell, and they loved it. But I thought it was interesting also to deal with limits because at any point you would never be further than 50 meters away from the edge of the intervention. So this is a topographical intervention that will run on seven and a half kilometers and would potentially keep going north towards uh, Europe as there is no limit to the site. Remember, the site is somewhere around here, so it could be way up, way closer to Africa. And at night, it would look fantastic. They loved it, but uh, <coughs> so this is, this is a closer view and then a closer view. And it would be interesting also to cross things along our path, like uh, roads and agricultural land. Um, but Allahu Akbar, story is over. And you know where the story ended. Allahu Akbar, it's amazing. God is everywhere with the Arabs. And this was the end of Qazafi. Not a pretty picture. Allahu Akbar, God is great. So after um, Libya, uh, we worked uh, in Manama, Bahrain. You might know Bahrain from the Formula One uh, Grand Prix or the swinging towers, mainly designed by big US or British or, or, or Australian uh, 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 corporate firms. A lot of these stupid tall buildings, and this is modernity in the Arab world, it's very sad. Uh, everything is very superlative um, in, in, these, in, these, in these projects. So I was, um, I was commissioned the hotel, and it was supposed to be the best hotel in the world. That was the brief. Give us the biggest, best, 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 highest, whatever hotel. This was, I think, at the end came close to 200 meters high. And the idea here is that we would, we would, we would put slabs uh, 10 meters apart, one from the other, and on every slab uh, we would put tents. So the building would have no facades, and then we would cultivate these slabs that they would be fairly deep to have trees in them. And this would be, uh, as far as I know, the first building in the world that doesn't have facades. So the air runs through it. And the idea is that we would have suspended gardens, and uh, this is a very, looks like an Orientalist painting. I love that, with the Arabs in the corner. Um, so that was the idea. and. Um, the idea is that you come out of the elevator core and go out in the open, the wind is blowing. Uh, you go through your garden into your tent. You would have your own swimming pool, your own little garden. Uh, the slab would be deep enough to hold trees and all the infrastructure would come from underneath. So you would, f you would, you would service the rooms, HVAC, electricity from the ground. It made total sense, huh? uh, even in terms of energy use as all the common areas would not be uh, ventilated or, or HVAC systems or and no facades, except we would spend a lot of money on structure and concrete. But uh, 
Bahrain also had its revolution, although it had its swinging towers already. But so uh, at this point, well, thanks to the to the Saudis, uh, the revolution was repressed and is still sort of under control. But the project is on hold. Saudi Arabia, where I was approached by a Saudi princess uh, with a very interesting story. Uh, the lady wanted to do the second, because this is the first woman's only leisure facility. Uh, a very strange concept. A space dedicated only for women, where only women are allowed to go in. Men are not allowed to go into that space. And uh, the woman can be pampered inside, they can be massaged, they can make their hair, they can have their nails done. And imagine it's a heaven huh? without any men around in Saudi Arabia. So there's a space that does that already. But I was given a land uh, to build to build that. Uh, and at the foot of Burj al Mamlaka, where the Four Seasons is located, at the tip of a block, a very, very important address in Saudi Arabia, this was my site. So at the tip of the block and in front of this hideous building, which is Burj al Mamlaka, which you see on all the postcards of Saudi Arabia that magnificently portrays Saudi Arabia as a very modern city, uh, I decided not to put another phallus up, but to really push my building into the ground. So essentially the space, 3,000 something square meters, are uh, beneath the surface of the street and, uh, and under this big sheet of glass blocks. Uh, and everything you have, the only thing you have above ground is this service wall uh, that separates the building from the rest of the block. And in this service wall is where the men are allowed. They come and they carry the stuff, but beyond that point, they do not go. And you have two little towers here which are elevator towers. They're seven meters high because the travel of the elevator is seven meters to take you down minus seven meters below ground. And on top of the elevator towers, you have these two little insects here. So this is the tower. And the insect uh, is, in fact, there are two cockpits in which you have an elevator operator that moves the elevator up and down. Uh, and the elevator operator is stuck inside his, um, his, uh, his cockpit, which is air conditioned with the two fake wings. I had to put them so that it looks very feminine. And, um, and so you, you don't see the elevator operator, uh, the scary man who operates the elevator, but he sees you arriving, you see, and that's the service wall. And women in Saudi Arabia don't drive, they're driven, they're not allowed to drive. So they are taken to the, their destination, uh, they drive on the glass blocks, uh, which are at the level of the sidewalk, they're dropped off, at that point, the elevator operator sees the lady arriving, getting out of the car, and then pulls the elevator up. And then the elevator opens, says, I'm ouvre toi. The lady comes into the elevator. Once the door closes, she can take her wheel off, and she can be a supermodel if she wants to. And then she goes below the ground. It's a poor rendering, but imagine, imagine the pretty ladies walking around, uh, looking like Claudia Schiffer, and the man above crawling on the surface which is translucent. Uh, so they can see the men above and the cars arriving, but the men would love to see what is happening underneath, but they cannot see. So it was a very sexy building. It was a veiled building. Uh, it was like a woman's body that is covered by something that is translucent, and you want to look through, but you cannot. Yet the body from inside can see you. These are my hirondelles with the fake wings and the two cockpits of the elevator operator. This is the hideous, the hideous building of, of uh, Walid bin Talal, the, uh, this didn't happen, of course. Uh, we, we, I did a lot of work in the, in the Gulf. I could keep on going and going. And I've had, I don't know, tens of projects between 2002, 2003, and 2008. Then things slowed down with the crisis. But Kuwait is another place that has a lot of swinging towers designed by Americans. This is, I think, SOM. Look at how stupid this thing looks. It's 400 meters high, and it swings. It just wraps around for no reason. No? But they love them, and they pay these architects a lot of money. And, uh, and it costs them a lot of money to build this crap. But lots of them. This is modernity in the Arab world. No? It's importing, it's importing um, the work of, of uh, big American corporate firms into, into the Arab world without any critical thought whatsoever. So I had to come in and, and do some damage, try to kill these American firms. Um, and my first commission in Kuwait was a mall. And when my first trip to Kuwait, I was, uh, 
I was uh, I was taken to Kuwait uh, and I was I was given a tour of all the malls in Kuwait and it's very sad because all the malls I saw in Kuwait were malls I'd already seen in the U.S. Very generic malls. So you have family malls, you have uh, the cooler malls, see with even lingerie shops. Uh, you have the even more cool malls. Pathetic, very very pathetic. Uh, our, our building, our site was over 500 meters long, and um, and, I, and I realized it was about time we designed a mall that would kick the ass of American malls. In fact, this was a competition that we won against uh, big American firms who had been designing uh, malls by the dozen, and I had never designed a mall before. So before I started this project, I brought in a, um, a friend of mine who works out of Paris who had had some experiences with retail, who gave us uh, retail 101 lessons. And I realized that uh, the only way to win this competition was to do really a super mall, a mall that has absolutely it works like a Swiss watch, without any of the crap that the American malls put on to embellish the, the package. So it would be the Formula One of malls, the, the super mall that is built around uh, the absolute perfect diagrams around which a mall function. So I'm given these 101 mall diagrams, and I took them literally and put them on the side. And it gave me this, a building that is generated by the, by the structure of the parking, because malls, uh, particularly in Kuwait, they are not urban uh, buildings. They are buildings that function, that you arrive, you access by car. So the grid goes up. And uh, there's one strip, basically. And every single space has a pignon sur rue, has direct access onto the main atrium, because atrium space is prime. Um, but the one, the one, the one, the one particularity I, th I, I noticed in the malls in Kuwait was that they had these Luna Park kind of structures, uh, uh, they, these follies that were integrated in all the malls. I had never seen this in the U.S. Uh, and then you have to understand that a mall in Kuwait is is public space par excellence, uh, because of climatic reasons, because of because of cultural reasons. You don't just hang out on the streets in Kuwait. You you are either at home or at work, or at the mall. There is no other destination. So I realized, I thought that the mall really deserved to be a serious public building for once, and not the crappy US model. But I introduced the folly into my, into my building because it was, too, it was too tempting. It was the only specific thing I had noticed. And I, and I introduced a 40 meter high sky drop into the building that was part of the architecture. And the idea was that kids can come and attach themselves to this thing uh, in the air-conditioned space and comfortable space of the mall and then be <laughs> shot up 40 meters up in the sky in the warm dry desert uh, and then back down into the reality of shopping. Uh, this was the introduction to the mall. The clients loved it. And this is basically the, um, the roof of it which brings light into the space below into the, the, the central strip. It looks more like a, like a, like a European airport or a uh, or a, or a, well, anyway, this didn't happen either. But it was a very, very, very sophisticated piece of machinery. Uh, it would have beaten the, I hate this photo. We did more malls, uh, another mall also in Kuwait. And, uh, and they were very happy to have a Lebanese architect uh, uh, to, to, do, to, do, to design their mall because Lebanon is known for its greenery and its terraces and its, uh, and its water. And Kuwait doesn't have water and Kuwait is a very, very flat beige country where it's interesting. The first time I went to visit the site, I took photos of it and I went back to my office and my colleagues were looking at me. Uh, yes, but it's beige, north, east, west, south. It's beige and flat. So there was no point of visiting the site. And we realized we would give, we'd give these people some topography and some altitude and some water because they kept on insisting. One other sp very special thing about malls in the Gulf is that they all have incredible water features. So they have incredible things about things that they don't have. They don't have water. And um, so with uh, theaters and below ground. And then we slowly built up the mall into a topography, into a succession of platforms. And every level uh, can sort of extend out through these platforms. Uh, above the mall was a hotel, so we had a circuit with a drop-off above and then back down. And we managed to change the topo topography around uh, our environment and, and create this accident of 15 meters of topography, another reference level, 15 meters above the flat uh, topography, existing topography. 
some office space, and then um, the hotel, which looks like an ice block, and the water. They kept on asking for water, 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 where's the water? Um, so I gave them water by, um, well these, these are the plants, so you see it slowly builds up above the, the topographic uh, platform. And then the water was uh, literally a water, a water feature that masks the, the structure of the building that is above, which, which, is, which looks like an ice block. In fact, uh, hotel rooms in Kuwait are always freezing. Huh? Because it's very warm, they put on the AC, and you freeze your ass every time you're in a hotel room. I get sick every time I go, uh, because it, it, you have to wear your sweaters in the middle of the summer because it's extremely cold. So I gave them an ice block that looks extremely cold, and, 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 and waterfall that hides the structure that, that, that holds the building, and then the water continues onto the terraces and creates these um, Lebanese-like terraces. The clients loved it. This was 2006. We're still in, uh, we're, we're in construction documents phase. Things go very slowly in this, in this profession. So we're hoping this will happen. We also worked in Dubai. Again, very superlative uh, projects where uh, they have to have hanging gardens, a lot of water, an office building in Business Bay, but that didn't happen either. But so before I was, I worked like a, <coughs> like a whore for, for, uh, the, uh, for the Gulf, I did have some morals. So I, to, you know, to try to portray myself as a nice guy, I like to bring out this project, which I did when I was at school, when I was still in the US. Uh, I was working with a fantastic man, by, with Lebius Woods, who was supposed to be here tonight, but unfortunately, I think he cannot move much these days. And, um, and Evolving Scars is a project I designed back in 1991, I think, uh, when uh, the, the war was supposedly over, so we were in a supposedly a post-war situation. And um, the city center, the former city center, historical city center of, uh, of Beirut, which had been no man's land for 15 years, uh, was suddenly opened. And um, the private company that was in charge of rebuilding the city sent its bulldozers to basically clean up uh, as quickly as possible and sanitize the city center. So a lot of buildings were being wiped out, a lot of condemned building, and this was this was the sad reality of some buildings that were way too damaged. Uh, and at that point in time, I realized there was a very important uh, process we were not going through, and that was the scarring of the city. Not only the scarring of the city in terms of buildings, but the scarring uh, even on a political level. There's something very dangerous uh, in, 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 tr in trying to put the, the war in between brackets. War did not start on, on April 13, 1975, and it did not end with the Taif Accord in the early 90s. Uh, it's far more complicated than that. So to try to sanitize uh, the city and try to move from a state of malady, from a state of sickness to a state of peace so quickly uh, was something I felt a bit uncomfortable about. So I, I thought very naively that I could contribute uh, to Beirut and to the scarring process with this installation. Uh, and I started by reconstituting uh, a building which had no architectural value whatsoever. I was very young at the time. I was uh, 21, 22, 23. I was young and beautiful and full of hope and morals and good, good ideas. So um, I, I reconstituted, reconstituted this, this ruin that had no architectural uh, importance. To me, it was very important that it had no architectural importance, like there were lots of them in the city center, like there were lots of these buildings that were condemned, and uh, realized as I was bombarding this little piece of concrete that there was something incredibly, incredibly uh, attractive about uh, the destruction of war. Remember the first pictures I showed you in the beginning of the talk? Uh, something incredibly scary uh, in its, in its, in its, uh, in its, uh, anyway. So. Uh, I, I realized also that these buildings had to go, so the, the point of this exercise was to try to put together the device uh, that would demolish this, uh, this ruin, or these ruins, if we would perpetrate this exercise on many buildings. And um, uh, what it essentially is, 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 is two membranes that seal the ruin, so it's no longer a building you can penetrate. And the gap between the two, uh, the two membranes is equal in cubic meters to the amount of concrete that needs to be demolished. And what will demolish the concrete is this device, I called it the memory collector. The memory collector would be open to the public so people could come and feed the memory collector with memories that you could quantify in megabytes or in kilobytes. And the intensity of demolition would be proportional to the intensity of memory that is being inhaled by this memory collector. So as the memory collector collects memory, 
in the form of uh, data, uh, the machine eats up the ruin and disperses the ashes in the, in, the, in the double membrane. And the process goes on so that a new facade starts to appear with the ashes of the building as the ruin is being eaten up slowly by this thing. And this is a process that would take time and would be again proportional to the amount of, of, um, of information that is being fed to the machine. So this is the memory collector in action uh, and it gets towards the end where the membrane, uh, the double-sided membrane is almost full and at that point the memory collector starts digging its own hole in the ground and then uh, the whole structure collapses when the scarring process is over. This was a very naive, politically naive um, um, uh, project maybe because uh, back in the early 90s I thought that uh, I, had, I, had, uh, I had the hope that uh, there was a reconstruction project that was going to happen. Uh, and f in order for a reconstruction project to happen, process to happen, to rebuild a nation, you have to agree on a, on a history. There has to be a sort of a political consensus. This never happened in Beirut, so obviously this project never happened because politically it was impossible for it to happen. And we went on from the early 90s up until 2005 into a period I call uh, complete denial, political denial, where we were just moving forward and tucking the problems under the carpet. Uh, so politically, really, the, the, politically the, the war was not over, except that things were, were put under the carpet. They were put under the carpet, under the carpet until the carpet blew up in 2005 again under Hariri who, 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 who was assassinated. <coughs> so, so, so I came back to Beirut in 1993 with all these great hopes, uh, thinking that I would be part of a great project of reconstruction, of rebuilding a nation. But as I told you, Beirut was never rebuilt. And I went through three years of very difficult times of designing projects that aborted one after the other. In fact, 16 aborted projects that never saw the light and died in my drawers. So abortion after abortion after abortion, at some point I realized that all my ideals I was taught, uh, all the good ideas I, I, I had at school, uh, simply uh, did not work. It did not work because the city was in the hands of the private sector and there were other things at stake. And politically it was just, there was no reconstruction project. So I was recuperated by the entertainment industry. Not as a dancer, this is me, I had long hair. Huh? Um, and the entertainment industry, uh, through the entertainment industry, I built my first building, which was a temporary building. It's called the B018, B018 Club, in the quarantine. Um, a project that still touches me a lot these days, as it's still alive. Uh, it was supposed to die in 2003, but it's, it's still kicking, it's still alive. So you see, this is B018 alive uh, at night. And this is basically all these beat when it shuts down. So the roof is open when it's alive and it kicks boom, 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 boom music. And then, and then at some point, six, seven, whatever, eight in the morning, it shuts down. The roof recedes and closes. And uh, this is a guy passing out on the roof. This is a woman playing with her crotch. This is a guy, this is a guy taking his lover home and, and the bouncers don't care. Ready Suite was, uh, is located um, in, in, a, in the quarantine sector, uh, right near the port of Beirut. And it's a very sensitive sector because the quarantine was uh, the quarantine of the port of Beirut up until the end of the 19th century. Then in around the 1920s, it became a refugee camp for Armenians. But then the Armenians moved very quickly to this part of the city, right across the highway. Uh, this is the main artery that joins Beirut to the north, uh, so it's a very, very busy highway. And you see here the fabric is extremely dense, but what is strange is that the coastal side, which is where the quarantine is located, is very scarce. So you can still see on Google or on any map of the city something very strange that makes no sense urbanistically speaking because usually it is the littoral that gets developed first. And we're at the edge of Beirut, this is supposed to be prime, yet to this date there's nothing in the quarantine except the garbage company, the slaughterhouse, uh, the tanneries, so it stinks, my nightclub, a few light industries, army barracks, and my office. So it's a doomed area. Huh? Nobody wants to be in the quarantine. Somehow the city bypassed the quarantine on its sprawl, on its sprawl uh, northbound. Uh, so how do you build a club on a site, and during this denial period, on a site that is so sensitive because after being a refugee camp 
in the 1920s for Armenians. In 1948, it became refugee camp for Palestinians. And until 1976, it was a refugee camp. But in 1976, as Beirut was divided, and this fell in the Christians' hands, in the Falangist party's hands, uh, they came in and they wiped the camp completely and they burned it out. So we don't revisit really what happens. We don't really talk about history. But it was a very ugly thing that happened. It took about a week to clean it up. And uh, so how do you build a club, uh, a place of debauchery, where people are going to go drink and do all sorts of fun things uh, in a site which is so loaded with, um, with, uh, with history? So this is the quarantine, I think, uh, in the early Palestinian period, probably in, at some point in the late 40s or early 50s. My project uh, really worked on the, no the idea of the void, so uh, it has no facade. It's, uh, it's pushed into the ground, uh, but the car is very important. There is a carousel, uh, so you can drive your car, and if you have a Ferrari, you can keep driving in circles so people can see you. And if you have a Ferrari, it will be, it'll be parked here. If you have a shitty car, it'll be parked in the back. But the cars are, are parked very, very concentrically and very respectively of the piece that's in the middle of the club is right here. This is the roof closed, this is the roof open. And um, and you see, it's all it's all below the ground. Uh, its highest point is 70 centimeters above ground. Uh, I drew this project down to the last bolt because at that point I didn't have an office. I was working on my own, and we built this thing with with um, with uh, artisans that were outside the, build the building industry. So this is B18 uh, when it wakes up, and this is B18 when it goes to sleep. See, up. Sleep, up, sleep, up, sleep, up, sleep, up, sleep. And it works. So when, when I designed this thing and I, and I went to contractors, initially um, they refused to build it uh, because I had no prior serious experience in the building industry. They all thought it was unbuildable. So I said the hell with contractors and I went to a garbage truck manufacturer who thought it was a piece of cake. And in fact, it works. And the only thing that failed in this building was the waterproofing membrane, which was a standard building thing. But the steel works. It never leaked. It was a building that had a five years life expectancy initially. It is now 13 years old. It never leaked. And the roof is operated, I don't know how many times, every night. We never have a problem. We just change the oil every six months, and it works. So don't believe the contractors. Screw the building industry, because it's bad and you can do much better. Uh, so if you look at the details of this building, it's completely wrong by the construction industry standards. And I insist on this because really one, one major part of my resistance of my battle was against the building industry. And to tr by trying to revive uh, the relationship with local artisans. Uh, see, this is Bédizut when he wakes up at night, and this is it uh, uh, at night, inside. And this is me. This is part of the Johnny Walker uh, photo shoot. So you're going to see a lot of photos of me posing in my buildings. You know, it's very important. So I'm walking here, very confident. Uh, the building here is 13 years old. It's all rusty now. It was black initially, but it's all rusted now. But it still, it still functions very well. And this is Rafiel Hariri, who also stood on the roof of my building. Hariri was our our prime minister, a very, uh, very important figure in our history. Uh, this was taken in a film that was shot by a friend of mine uh, called, uh, the film was entitled The Man with the Golden Souls. This was back in 2000, so five years of before his assassination. This is one of the most important men in our recent, recent history, and he stepped on the roof of my building, like me. So after Bédi uh, which was a great success as a club, and it was great chemistry with my clients. I was very, very fortunate to live this adventure that lasted a bit more than six months. It was very, very quick from the time we took this site and the time I delivered, I delivered it built was about six months, which is extremely fast and with very, very limited financial means. Uh, the, the place was all over the, the, the club was all over the place uh, and the media getting a lot of media attention. So at that point, I was approached by other entertainers this is my second project, Central, uh, in a, on a structure that was literally at the edge of the, of the historic city center, uh, but right outside of it. 
and it was a house that was supposedly under protection, which to me was very annoying because I'm not a very nostalgic uh, about old buildings. So initially I wanted to tear it down. I tried to provoke anything to have it fall down and say it's not my fault, it just collapsed. But the client had this very nostalgic thing about old houses and he wanted to keep it. So I realized it was so absurd, so not me, that it was worth giving it a try. And I, I, owe, I, owe, I owe this concept to my engineer, my structural engineer, because I really didn't know what to do with this house. I didn't want to turn it back into a wedding cake or, or a postcard. I wasn't interested in that. So I, I knew there was something extremely important, which was the structure, because how do you consolidate the skin of a building when you void it out? Because inside, we had to do something else. This was built on load-bearing walls very cheaply. It was a poor man's house initially in the 1920s. It had, been go it had been going through a lot of ad hoc little alterations. So inside, it was like a maze, little rooms, three meters by three meters. My client wanted a big hall. He had no idea that it was impossible structurally. So I get the structural engineer, and the structural engineer gives me these fascinating little sketches, this lesson, this half hour 101 structure uh, lesson, uh, uh, explaining to me how you keep the skin of a building up when an old historical building, when you want to void it out. And the process is, is very sophisticated. You put belts around uh, the body, the skin of the building, uh, and then you connect these belts with temporary beams inside. And when you're done doing that, you start very carefully digging foundations at the inner, around the inner peripheral, periphery of the, of the skin. You uh, pour a new foundation with a waterproofing membrane and a new concrete wall, and you go up with this wall. And as you go up through this, with this structure, you go through the slabs, so you cut open the slabs to let that wall go up. And when you reach the roof, the top, at that point, you've separated the, the skin from the content. It's like face-off. I don't know if you've seen the movie. So you keep the skin in tension, and then you void out the inside. And when you're done, there's, there's, a new, there's a new body inside, there's a new beast inside that has nothing to do with what is outside. And usually what they do is that they remove the temporary belts, they replaster this, this stone, which is a very spongy stone, a local stone. They paint it, they, they paint it in, a, in, a, in a very cute pastel color because this is what is expected. And they call this uh, historical bullshit, falsification of history. So I decided to keep the temporary belts, and I, and I, and I, and I worked again with artisans, uh, fantastic artisans. This, this is a structure of the roof, and you understand why it's circular. It has, a structural, it has a structural role, but it also serves as tracks for the roof. See, this is it under construction. I spent a lot of time on site uh, towards the end. It was fascinating. Uh, there was no point of being in the office, so I was conducting the works on site. Inside, now you have one big open hall with very interesting proportions, 17 meters by five and something meters width by 10 meters of height, in which I placed one large table. And inside the table is a circuit for the waiters. So the waiters are prisoners of the table. They cannot escape the table. They stay inside, and the only way out is the, the staircase that takes them down to the hall, to the hall, literally, which is where the kitchen is located. So you're seated around, like in a very assembly-like type of uh, layout, with furniture we've designed with very high backs and very, very heavy chairs. And the waiters are walking here. And if you look carefully at the section, you'll see that the waiters are standing on a plane that is 40 centimeters lower than the plane you're seated on, so that their eyes are always lower than yours. You look down at them, the prisoners, here. And then there's a bar upstairs uh, in the structure you just saw, which is under construction here. And I kept the belts. I kept the belts, and to accentuate the process of, 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 of rotting of the facade, uh, I did not replaster it, as there's a waterproofing membrane behind, and there's no point of waterproofing through the plaster. And, uh, and I kept it rotting, and I've, and I've added a layer of wire mesh so that you do not touch the stone. Uh, you could literally poke a hole in it with a pen if you wanted. So it's very, very spongy stone and very soft. And I played on the poetry of, of its decay. And then as the pieces are still falling off, they wouldn't hurt anybody because they're trapped in the, in the, uh, in the wire mesh. So this is, this is a picture of the setup inside. And what you see here are not microphones. They are little pilot lamps. They light up your plate. Uh, so you don't, there's no point to talk to anybody. You just watch the people huh? and watch the waiters. It was an interesting setup. 
and it went on for uh, over a year. Surprising that my clients went so far with me, but after a while we had to we had to change the setup. It was too intense. I didn't realize to what point architecture could be so uh, could create such. Um, I had given up maybe on on uh, on 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 the hopes that we could create situations and provoke certain behaviors, uh, maybe not so architecturally, but through, through, uh, through putting together what I call in French, the dispositif, uh, devices or apparatuses. Uh, and and the, so the roof uh, of the bar upstairs, which is suspended above the main hall, functions this way. You see, it opens and closes. And the artisans were fantastic because it never broke down. So after that, I had a label, the label of the entertainer architect, and two labels, I had two stars. You have to put labels on you, otherwise you don't exist. Two stars, one which is the entertainment architect, and the second one is the convertible roof architect. And that's me again, Johnny Walker. <laughs> Very confident. Huh? I look good in this picture. And, uh, Yabani is my third project, and always, I was always given these very difficult and, and impossible assignments. Yabani is another entertainment destination. At this point, any entertainment project I would do would make it on wallpaper, in all these stupid travel magazines and these, all these fashion magazines, uh, but not in architecture magazines because architects did not like me. They thought this was not architecture. So Yabani is located on the, uh, on the demarcation line that separates, used to separate West Beirut from East Beirut. And at the time, we were, I had a visionary client who thought he would be the first one to put an entertainment destination on Damascus Road, which at that point in time was still squatted and had still very, very visible scars of the recent conflicts. We're in 99, 2000, and at this point, the building next door is squatted by refugees, mainly Syrian workers who work probably for $150, $200 a month, living in very poor conditions without handrails, without windows, uh, literally squatters, and here we are building, erecting a monument for sushi that's going to serve you sushi at $100 a pop. So very, very not correct politically. See, I'm not an architect of libraries or public housing or schools. I never did that. I worked for entertainment in the beginning and the rich mainly, which is not a very moral thing to do. I never thought I didn't want that. Huh? Don't look at me like this. I'm not... Uh, uh, I, I really wanted to build, uh, remember Ivo, Ivo Rink's cars, the project I did at school. I was a nice guy, but, but you know, this, this is a sad story of Beirut, uh, but not so sad because there are places of pleasure, I, I, we, we, and there are places I go to. I'm not cynical. Yabani is really a project about the impossibility of its existence and the absurdity of its, the absurdity of its existence on a very, very, on a very, in a very specific moment in time on a very specific site. Uh, and what we've done, one more time here, is push the program below the ground. So I, I can be a very shy man, but we had, at the same time, we had to, we had to, we had to recognize the absurdity of our gesture. So we erected this, this, uh, this piece. Uh, usually, restaurants or nightclubs are tucked in buildings. You never, you never give them a building. You don't build a restaurant or a nightclub. They're secondary spaces. They're frivolous spaces, and particularly temporary buildings. But uh, these operations are so successful financially, and all three of them are, um, are built on temporary, on, on, on sites that are, um, that are rented, meaning they're temporary and they have a, a very limited lifespan. But uh, we, we've, we've, we've built this tower, which contains the reception, which is a big vitrine, seven meters high, and the nostrils of the project, the mechanical stuff that you usually hide, but we've expressed it. And then the rest of it is below the ground and gets the light through the skylight windows, the walk-on skylight windows. So there you go. See this guy? He probably makes 150 bucks a month. Uh, it would pay him a meal and a half downstairs here. So there's something very, again, very difficult about designing such places. Um, see this, uh, his underwear and his, uh, and his uh, um, up on the street. So how do, you, how do you create an environment for uh, the patrons? that enables them to eat comfortably sushi uh, without doing that naively, because that would be dangerous, while still assuming the situation. Uh, this is Yavani at night. This is not a photomontage, this is real. And then when you're below, your only relationship with the outside is the sky, God, and nothing but God. And you're in complete denial. 
and, it, uh, and then to, to access the space, you go into the circular room, which is located at street level, and it sucks you down, and you land in the center of the bar. So if you're shy, don't do it. But uh, it's a very glamorous arrival. Um, and then uh, this is like an éprouvette, so you see the, you see the, the platform moving up and down, uh, and you see people arriving, and everything is concentric and very precise. This is another proje project for which we built everything uh, down to the ashtray. We didn't buy anything from the construction industry. See, and they, and they are enjoying their sushi, while literally behind the wall is a completely different world. But this is Beirut, so you either do it or you don't. Um, and we will have, I'm sure we'll have this debate at the end, but I'm sure some of you here are gonna tell me, uh, you are such a bad man, uh, why do you do this? Hmm? Why don't you build social buildings, public housing, universities, schools, libraries, opera houses? Huh? What we see in architectural magazines, huh, these, exceptionally, uh, these exceptional programs that portray the world like everything is fine, huh? like uh, the state is here for us and the world is beautiful. But what you don't realize is that uh, over 99% of the built environment in cities are in the hands of the private sector. And if we as architects do not recognize this, the city will happen without us and despite us, us uh, architects with very good morals. Uh, so in fact, I think that uh, it is not good morals to turn your back to such programs, uh, but it becomes very tricky and very sensitive and sometimes dangerously explosive to handle these, but to try to do them in a way that hopefully is relevant. So this is a plan of Yabani, you see it's very, very precise. This is an exploded axle of, and this is me again, look, very, very confident, very proud. I look good in this picture, no? <laughs> so <coughs> I, worked, I worked for the entertainment industry and I also worked with banks. So this tells you a lot about the place where I come from. Um, uh, the, inter the entertainment tourism industry is a very important player in the, in the economy, but banks are also extremely important in our economy. In fact, banks are, have always been, throughout the war, the untouchables. They were beyond politics. Uh, so I served the banks. I worked with the devil one more time. And this is one of the assignments I had, which consisted of designing an, an identity package for the Banque Libanaise pour le Commerce in a little town, which is about 10 minutes away from the Syrian border. And I was very surprised that the chairman of the bank gave me this plot which is in Stura, in the middle of nowhere, as a first uh, prototype to build uh, the identity project for the bank that would be replicated and reproduced across the territory. But why Stura? Because Stura is in the middle of nowhere. Why can't you give me a site in Beirut? And he wouldn't answer, he wouldn't answer until I went to Stura and I drove through Stura. Stura is basically one strip where there is agricultural land left and right. But uh, just right along the strip are banks and incredible pavilions, very, very fancy. They spent a lot of energy and a lot of money building these pavilions. And I never understood who are these pavilions built for because Stura is in the middle of nowhere. It's so far from Beirut. Until one day I kept on asking my client and then the chairman told me, you have to understand my son. Syria, this is 2004, Syria doesn't have any private banks. So as this road is uh, taken by politicians who at the time we're going to Syria to get their orders, these idiots on their way up to get their orders from, from the Syrians. There were cars coming the other way, but that nobody knew, with plastic bags full of money that they would come and dump into Lebanese banks. So this was our revenge against the Syrians. So this explains maybe this project, which turns its ass towards Damascus, and is shaped literally by the movement of cars around it. It's a very introverted building, which has beautiful little gardens inside, and little meurtrier snipers windows, and a mouth that spits money <laughs> with an ATM machine. And again, the, me the mechanical systems above. Uh, I, this is a highway building, of course, and there's another highway building, which will be the last of my temporary buildings I will talk about. Um, it's located on a main artery, again, north of Beirut, uh, part of a site that is owned by one major clothing fashion retailer where uh, he owned this little building in the back, which it was not important what we would do inside. What was important was visibility on the highway. And the new law prevented us from, uh, from building 
within this setback, uh, we, we, we've done a very, very simple intervention which constitute in terms of building permits of, of adding a, um, an arm which would hold a big LED screen, an ATM machine, and a vitrine. So this does not fall into building, into exploitation square meters. And what it does is basically scream on the highway the presence of a building. In an environment where vertical facades have, uh, vertical surfaces have more value than the horizontal plates of the buildings, which were the primary initial function of these buildings. As the Lebanese understood very well that visibility is more important than the real function of the buildings. So this highway is full of buildings that look like residential buildings that they could exist in an, in an urban environment, but slowly but surely they're being completely camouflaged by huge billboards and they're being voided out because their visibility and the advertising space that they sell on their facades is more important than uh, the space itself. It's a little bit like, uh, like one Times Square. You know, the building is empty beyond the ground floor. It's totally empty. Yet it is the most, probably the most expensive piece of property in the world. But it's completely eaten up by signage. So this was, a, uh, this was a highway building, a building that you're supposed to see at 100 kilometers an hour. This is not an urban building. So I, my, I started my career with six uh, temporary projects. Excuse me, I started my career with 16 abortions first. 16 abortions, a champion of abortions, and then after the 16 abortions, there were other abortions, but the first six build projects were projects that had a very limited time span, meaning uh, they had a lifespan that varied between five and 10 years pretty much. It's a very strange thing for an architect to be given an assignment where uh, you're, you're being told before you design your building that on a very specific date, it will be bulldozered. It's very strange for an architect because we're educated to work with in permanence. Huh? permanence. Uh, we build with concrete, with stone, things that are permanent. As I don't believe in God, I thought that when I went to school that I would be building things that would be eternal because when I'll be gone six feet underground, these buildings will still be up. Yet, very strangely, when I start practicing, the, the first six buildings uh, I am given to build have a very limited time span. So I am told that my babies are going to die three, five, ten, whatever years after I've given birth to them. So it's, it, 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 it puts me in, in a very strange situation with temporality, one that is radically different than what we're, we're being educated uh, as architects. Um, but my first permanent building is this one. And after these temporary buildings, uh, it became very strange to design uh, a building that would be permanent. I had this, um, that was very uncomfortable. And I'm very proud to say that after designing six temporary buildings that were very loud, although I want to believe that they are uh, buildings that were shaped by concepts, but at the end of the day, they were loud uh, in their shapes. Um, the first building I designed that is permanent, I did not design, and I'll explain to you how. I did not design the plans of this building. I did not design the section of this building, the envelope of it. I did not design its elevation. As my client, a young dynamic developer, wanted to develop something that is called a shell and core development. A shell and core development is a building uh, in this high-end sector of the residential markets. You design, uh, you build buildings, but you do not finish them inside as these people come in usually with their interior architects and they finish them with their interior architects. So you spare them the cost of the finishes and you give them usually a bare space. Uh, but, but still a space which has its limitation, its structure, its facades, its whatever. And since he was so undecisive about the type of surfaces he had, because one day he calls me and says, I have clients for 200 square meters, the next day he would call saying that he has clients for 500 square meters. So I decided to take the term shell and core, which is usually a very reductive for us architects, because we like to control everything down to the ashtray, like I showed you in my initial projects, where everything uh, is handled by us down to the furniture. Here, it's exactly the opposite. In the world of permanence, in the world of permanence, I, I am I am I'm, I'm deprived of the control I'm supposed to have on my piece. So I tried to make an exercise out of it, and I said, what happens if uh, I give total control to the processes and to the logic of this development? And I take the shell and core term literally to its extreme. So we shape the building by the maximum allowable envelope on this site, which is twice the width of the street 
uh, vertically and then at the slope of one to two. So the volume of the building is designed by the building law, not by me. It is the maximum cubic meters allowable on this site by law. And then uh, the building has no structure inside. So it's literally the shell that holds and the core. They're the only two fixed elements. The plans are completely free. At that point, I deliver the project to my client. He starts selling apartments, 200 square meters, 400 square meters, 500 square meters. And they start climbing up into the section, which is a split section, um, until it ends up being filled by seven different tenants. We didn't know how many there would be until we get to the maximum built up area within that envelope. And at that point, every, every one of the seven clients had an interior architect. And they were calling me one after the other. Can you please give us the facades? I said, no, you design the facades because uh, you will be designing your own plans. You send me your interior facades and I'll project them to the outside. So I recapitulate. I did not design the morphology of this building. The building law did. I did not design the plans. The seven different architects did. I did not design the elevations. The seven different architects designed them. So in fact, I did not design this building as an architect at least. This is it. It sits at the edge of the newly rebuilt city center right here. And uh, out of a pure coincidence, it's right next to Centrale. So this is my second temporary building. This is my first permanent building, uh, which strangely has an interesting shape, although I did not design its shape. So don't go looking for any swinging or irregular or whatever on the facade. I'm not, I don't play that game. It just happened this way. It was a result of the life of the building. So you see the, the windows are not aligned. They all have a logic of their own. But come on, it's very clean, no? isn't it? Very, very clean. Yes, fake wood. Composite wood, made in China. And we have a very interesting vis-a-vis -vis in, in, in this building, where you can be in your bedroom and you could look at your living room across the street. So you don't live in a box, but you sort of embrace the geometry of the site. And strangely, it aligns very well and fits into its environment. It's a very, I know it's pretentious to say that, but it's a very contextual building. It really is. And the, the, the skin lights up. See, this is, we're in, oops. We're in the bedroom and we're looking across into the living room. This is the feminine me, huh? building with flower pots. Eight dollar per, per flower pot. Uh, this is a building about proximity, very narrow streets, and the idea here is that uh, pretty soon the greenery would grow and would start falling down and create this green curtain that would filter uh, the light, and you could trim it according to how hairy you want your facade and how, how much you want it to breathe. Uh, and it sits as a very simple frame huh, on the street, but it creates an interesting episode on the street. And I'm very happy every time I drive or walk by there, I stop. And I see people walking by, they look at it and they smile. So it really is the best reward. So you see from, from entertainment to banks to residential buildings, and essentially this is what we do mostly now. Um, this is another, with the same developer, this is a building that is a very simple story on a split section where the kids live upstairs they can walk out of their room, go down, walk around the olive tree. Olive trees were specified in the facade, so they were part of the specifications of the building. They can walk around the olive tree, go down and say hello to their parents, back up into the kitchen and out into the living room and back into their room without ever walking inside if they decided to. Of course, the same circuit that happens inside, but uh, it's a completely different relationship with the city. And uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, I have been fighting uh, th this, this typology of plans that has been the standard for the last 40 years, which consists of uh, a blind central core in the middle, uh, reception spaces in the front, family spaces in the back with blind corridors, very deep slabs that are completely concealed from the outside. So this is another form of resistance, but um, maybe more subdued, maybe more subtle than the earlier projects, which are much louder. But uh, here, uh, it is definitely, I think, uh, 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 trying to establish a relationship with the city, uh, with your direct environment, and strangely, it is very Mediterranean. Me again, the Johnny Walker campaign.
but they have the eyes closed. I don't look that good. 893 is another one of, of these developments where there are two apartments on the plan, a very difficult uh, on, the, on each level, very difficult site because it had 14 meters of frontage on the street and over 50 meters of depth. So it, it was an impossible plot to develop and about 15 meters also of denivelation between the street facade and the back. So the, uh, the bank that owned this plot couldn't sell it for years. Every time they would put it on the market, uh, developers would do a feasibility study and run away. So my client got it for very, very little money because it's very, it's very well located but unbuildable and came to me right before signing his deal asking me whether I could guarantee all uh, the built-up area that the site allowed us by law. So it was a, an acrobatic exercise, but I think we succeeded very well and we did something very simple. We aligned to the party wall and realized that because there's a, a public staircase here, uh, the setback with the public staircase was more important than the, than the setback we had on the street, so we had more important view corridors on the side. And here again, uh, you have cross ventilations on the reception pavilions, uh, a balcony that runs along uh, all the rooms, so you can circulate uh, to any, any room and through any part of the house without walking inside if you felt like it, from the kitchen to the bedrooms, up and down to the reception, and always projected to the outside. So I like slabs that are not deep, and uh, the notion of being pulled out always to the outside and really uh, in, 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 in the proximity to the environment, to the outside environment. This is a section, and you understand here how the split system works, the reception areas. And the building is really shaped by uh, the parcours, the, the walk around and the hugging of the, of the plan on its periphery. You see, you can go up to the bedrooms from the outside from the family living, you can see the balcony going across and the other balcony of the, of the reception and dining room space across a void. And then again, uh, so it's full of passages. And um, I believe that even in, 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 even in the world of, of private residential developments, you can still trigger pleasure no? by trying to, and this is, uh, this is the garden we were able to do with by creating this setback. So you see, I'm not only, I'm not only a, a bad boy who dances on graves and who, who designs frivolous spaces, but we, uh, we, we, are also, we also do more serious things, spaces where you can uh, actually live and raise your kids. But then again, the building takes on these strange shapes that, that are really a result of its plan. This is a, 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 a recent building. We, uh, the two twin chalets in the mountains uh, in the ski resort where we decided not to give a facade on the, on the access road uh, but really try to trigger again um, an instance of pleasure. Uh, we are at about 2,000 meters of altitude literally hovering about Mount Lebanon, about or above Mount Lebanon and they wanted a small pool so uh, I closed the south facade which is the street facade, gave two entrances and a one flight stairs that go up and take you to the pool where you literally feel like a god because you are, you are floating above the mountains and, and two sun tanning decks. Simple, as simple as that. And you can see the three quarters, you sort of understand how it sits on the site. And a closer view of the fake wood made in China. And then up the stairs, great reflection with the, the handrails. This is me again, Johnny Walker. Um, <coughs> so I, I build, I build a lot, a lot uh, also for the rich. This is one client of mine, the chairman of a bank I served for many years, who uh, commissioned me his mountain house, which was again another, uh, another uh, dispositif of pleasure where we tried to trigger uh, exceptional moments of pleasure for this man who isolates himself in the mountain, himself in the mountain. Uh, this is his bathroom. Uh, very sophisticated roof. Again, we worked with artisans. There are 52 engines in this roof. It's literally like a spaceship. But uh, you don't do handrails like this here, I bet. Huh? You can't. Thick steel plates. So uh, one, other one of these gizmos was the flying balcony. Boom, boom. Because his wife didn't go, didn't want to take the steps to come down from the from the living room to the swimming pool, I told her she could sit on the balcony, push a button, be down. It works. And uh, he has his bedroom, she has her bedroom, but the idea here is that 
they can close, open, close, and literally sleep under the stars with a fantastic sky at this altitude. 52 engines that manage the natural ventilation, uh, the opening, the blackout of the, of the, of the, of the roof structure. Uh, we can do things in Beirut with artisans without resorting to uh, the standards of the building industry. There you go. Um, this, is, this is a recent project that's under development. This is a big urban toy. It's the Beirut Fitness Center uh, commissioned to me by the, com the company that's in charge of rebuilding the city center. So it's 120 meters by 80 meters uh, temporary building where uh, we have all sorts of things that you can, that you can, that can make your body look good. Um, still under development. I don't like to speak too much about buildings that are not completed. Um, this is under construction now. It's called Artist Studios, but it's too expensive for artists. Uh, the idea is to sell apartments to people who want to live like artists uh, and can afford it. So, um, see it has a tail here, and the tail is a counterweight of an elevator, which is very big, in which you could bring your collector car up, and it can turn, and then you can drive your car into your apartment. So imagine you're leaving the My Night Club, and you have a nice lady with you, you drive your car, press of a button, you go up, and then boom, she's in your living room, in your car. <laughs> and every time, every time the elevator goes up and down, uh, the counterweight moves like the tail of a dog that's uh, hmm, here. So you can know that there is a, a 300 SL going up or down or whatever. Uh, <coughs> this was a fantastic site, probably the, the most amazing site I've ever worked on for a very eccentric man uh, who was a very powerful man, a Kuwaiti man, who was given a visit of the Cedars Reserve in the Shuf Mountains, which is an incredible, probably the, the prettiest area of our country, where there's the biggest reserve of uh, the Cedars of Lebanon. Um, and uh, he was taken up to the top of a, top of a hill uh, by a very influential politician who was giving him a tour of the reserve. And when he got up there, he, he stood. It's a, it's a mount that was shaved. The top of it was shaved by the Israeli army in 1982, uh, because from that point, you can see Beirut, but you can also see the Beka Valley. You literally have 360 degree view. So it was a very strategic point on which they had placed a battery of missiles. And then when they left, they left uh, the, the, the mount with a shaved top, which created a circular site of about 60 or 80 meters of diameter. So when the man stood up there, he told our politician, I want to die here. But the politician told him, and literally above the, the, above the, above the clouds, because it's an amazing, amazing altitude. <coughs> and the politician told him, I cannot give you this site because this is state property. But th since this man doesn't take no for an answer, he finally uh, got an okay uh, not to own the site, but to temporarily enjoy it for a few years as he would build a house on it. So the politician sent him to me so that he doesn't build a very heavy castle on it. And explained to me that we had to do a very minimal intervention and not to do a lot of damage to the site. So what I did is sat on the site and took a panorama, 360 degree views. Uh, and then, and then and my first presentation consisted of telling him, uh, this is where is going to be the orientation of each part of the program, uh, literally. And the project would be that. Absolutely no material intervention on the site. He loved the idea. I went to work. and presented in the second session this thing, uh, which is literally like a circular observatory on, top of, on, the, top of the, on the top of the mountain, uh, where the only material intervention, uh, opaque, is uh, the thin cylinder, uh, the thin uh, disc which constitutes the roof. Um, so in plan, I left a void inside, and the, the slab, the inhabitable part of the house, is never more than 10 meters, and is open to the internal court and to the outside, so you access from underneath and you arrive into the central courtyard. In the center of the courtyard, uh, right in the middle of it, we put a hole that collects all the, all the snow uh, melting and all the water uh, from the site, and we threw photovoltaic uh, 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 plateaus all around, all across the site to heat uh, the sphere, which is 80 meters of diameter, and will be finished in in, in marble, so that my client 
could literally float in the belly of the site and maybe die in there. And because the water uh, would be heated constantly, you would have like a volcano, some, some steam coming out of it constantly in the winter. Uh, so I show him this, but, but as, uh, as I show him the facades, he gets really disappointed because he sees that it has mullions. And the man doesn't take no for an answer. He goes, but you're lying to me because the first thing you showed me uh, had nothing, and now suddenly I have mullions. And you have to explain to this man that in order to, to hold curved glass that is five meters high, you need mullions in order to open them. And he said, no way, no way, no way, until one day he comes to Beirut with his uh, new yacht that is 70 meters high with a chopper on it, and he invites me to the yacht and tells me, come, my kid, let me show you what I do. He takes me down to the engine room, and he shows me these two big turbines, and he tells me that this was the only private vessel in the world that was propelled by these kinds of turbines that are developed for uh, the military submarines because they don't emit vibrations. So he said, go back to work. I don't want mullions. So I went back to work, and, uh, and, I, and I realized that we could do like with cars. We could, we could, we could have the, the windows slide down, but we'd be left with the structure, and then we could have the structure go down. <laughs> so uh, we did that. We submitted it to a German firm, specialists in, uh, in Germany, who sent us the first estimate, seven and a half million dollars, just for the facade, and I got approved. But the project didn't happen. <laughs> anyway, so uh, last but last, not, not last but not least, this is uh, this is a cemetery of my of my of my work. It's a piece I built uh, that was commissioned to me by an art gallery that is literally right upstairs of my office, which is right here. My office is known for its red uh, epoxy finish. Red because it keeps my guys nervous. It keeps my acrobats very nervous. It's not a very so it keeps them alive at three in the morning. Uh, um, so everybody associates with my office with this red color on the floor. Uh, <coughs> and the gallery is right upstairs, has the same structure, the same space, literally morphologically the same. Uh, <coughs> the title of the exhibition was Moving Homes, but I don't care. Uh, I did not really respond to the title of the exhibition. And what I did is a cemetery of my project, a device that allows you to travel through my archives uh, and by doing that also address the question of the impossibility of representing my work through drawings or photographs. Uh, and the fact that to me a drawing was not architecture. We're not going to get into that debate. It's, it's very complicated. I don't feel like it tonight. But um, So the idea is that you would start in this, um, let me take you out exactly. So you're hung by the balls, your head in the device. Uh, the device has eight screens that are connected to eight PCs for which we have managed to launch eight operations simultaneously so that the documents that you see run simultaneously and give you a 360 degree view as you can gyrate inside like a baby uh, and turn around and look at the content. Initially starts with a 360 degree view. See, this is the first frame or eight frames of the space of the gallery. And then it slowly mutates uh, into my office. So you see my office appearing on the same structure. So these are taken at, I think, 10 or 15 seconds uh, increments. And you keep going until the gallery has completely disappeared. You're in my office, but then my office dematerializes completely, 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 where you get to the red ground. And the red ground is where uh, my models, my computer models, are uh, floating and gyrating in space, uh, voided out of their materiality. And in the very far background is the 360 degree view of the environment that uh, the projects never really attained. So is this architecture? It has never reached its destination, its context. I'm a very context uh, specific architect, I'd like to think. I don't believe that drawing uh, or architecture can be uh, an autonomous discipline and that um, uh, an, uh, projects that don't happen in a context for me are not interesting. Um, and this is my office, see the red floor. I like motorbikes. This is POW. Somehow my art pieces always make it back to my office because I don't like to sell them. This is Rula, I think, and she's here somewhere in the audience. No, is it you? No, it's not you. And this is me. This is how I arrive to the office every morning on my motorcycle. 
it will be it for tonight. Thank you. ask stupid questions, I can be very mean. <laughs> no, I won't be. Questions? Don't ask me if I'm green. We have one here. Yes. Uh, can you, the mic is kind of in, in, in many of your projects, you used fake wood from China. Uh, how does it affect the cost of the project? It's cheap. It's cheap. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we get very crappy wood in Lebanon. We, we were known for our cedars, but don't believe the story. That's bullshit. That's postcards. We don't have any cedars left, um, or very little. We used to build ships. The Phoenicians built chips, ships out of the fantastic wood we used to have, but we, we cut all the trees. There's no, no trees left, so we have to buy the plastic from China. It's cheap. And it doesn't bend. Any more questions? Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>